Anyway, I, I kind of treasured this in my heart. Um, finished up my, my army service. Well, it took a long time. It was two years total. <clears throat> and the last 18 months, I took up boxing very seriously, and, and I was um, winning the battle on the outside. I couldn't be bullied and pushed around. But deep in my heart, I felt such a, an emptiness and such a hatred as well for those who'd been persecuting me and been anti-Semitic, which, of course, God has dealt with that in my life. Um, in fact, since then, I even thought at one point I was called to be a missionary to the Afrikaners. That's how much healing God has done in my life. And there's many of them who are wonderful Christians. But anyway, so I was, I was in this dilemma. I just wanted to leave South Africa and never come back because I felt like I was not treated as a South African but as a Jew, as someone as if I didn't belong there. So uh, I went to Israel, lived there for a while, lived on a kibbutz for a while, came to New York City where I was a student. I said to my dad, if I'm going to study in America, I want to go where the action is, to the Big Apple. And I was there in the Big Apple, and I certainly took a big bite out of the Big Apple, <laughs> but it didn't satisfy me. I had everything that you'd think would make a young man happy, and yet I still wasn't happy. I had a void in my life that only God could, could fill. So I uh, came back to Israel in the summer of 1984, back to the same kibbutz, and while I was there, I was traveling with a friend of mine from Zimbabwe who was my, my wrestling and rugby playing buddy. And um, a born-again Christian from Washington, D.C. came and shared a room with us. And uh, I can honestly say the first time in my life that I met a born-again Christian, or I don't know what born-again was, but a Christian, who loved Israel and the Jewish people was an American Christian. <laughs> and that's huge. You know, because if you look at Europe and the history of Europe and really just about the whole world and church history, the only church that is known to love the Jewish people, I mean really known, to really love the Jewish people in Israel, you know, are the believers in America, the evangelical body in America. And I'm so grateful and so thankful for that because that was a turning point in my life. Frank began to talk about Jesus um, in the context of uh, Israel and Jerusalem, and I remembered thinking, what on earth was Jesus doing in Israel? I had no clue he'd ever been there. I had no clue he was a Jew. I thought he was the first Catholic ever. <laughs> I really did, because the Christians I knew hated the Jews, so I never thought Jesus could be Jewish. I really thought that the, 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 the reason that his name was Jesus Christ is because his parents were Joseph and Mary Christ. So obviously the son's Jesus Christ. You know, it makes sense. <laughs> and then, I mean, if you look at the most famous art pieces, Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper, None of them look Jewish. I mean, Jesus and the disciples, they look like Swedish choir boys from Western Europe, <laughs> you know? And then the only one who looks Jewish is the evil betrayer, Judas. Thank you very much, you know? <laughs> he looks like a Jewish caricature with a huge nose and black hair and beady little eyes, you know? And I mean, it really didn't help the Jewish cause at all, even though I love great art, you know? So I remember, for those of you who've, who've been to Israel, you're probably familiar with Jaffa Gate. I was walking towards Jaffa Gate with my friend about to go to the, to the Arab market to do some negotiating and, and bartering, which I kind of enjoyed. And as I was walking there with my friend, I began to have a thought that a young Jewish man probably shouldn't be having, <laughs> unless the Holy Spirit was drawing him. And here was the thought I began to, began to have. This is not the city of David. This is the city of Jesus. Why would I be thinking that as a Jew? Because the Bible calls it the city of David. And I'm walking towards the, 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 the gate, Jaffa Gate, and all of a sudden, I mean literally just as real as, as Michelle sitting there in the front row, there was Jesus standing about 10 feet in front of me, just looking at me with the most incredible eyes and look that I've ever seen in my life. And immediately, the first thing I thought was, wow, he looks so Jewish. <laughs> I was like, I was literally shocked. And I was about to turn my friend to my friend and grab his arm and say, hey, look, there's Jesus. But I realized that he wasn't seeing Jesus and neither was anybody else. It was just me. And as I said, the first thing I knew is, wow, he looked so Jewish. He looked so in context <laughs> in Israel. The second thing that I knew immediately, I shouldn't have been having this thought as a Jew unless the Holy Spirit was drawing me, which he was. But I didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit or, or who or what that was. The second thought I had immediately was this is more than a man. I just knew it immediately by revelation. And the third thing that I knew was that he loved me with a perfect and unconditional love even though he knew every sin that I'd ever committed and every sin that I ever would commit. He was completely unfazed by that. 
And I didn't know the scripture that said that while we were yet sinners, God loved us and all. I didn't know any of those scriptures, but I experienced that love. And then he spoke a word to me, a resounding word into my spirit. It was an audible voice, and it was Hineni. So any time I've ever actually heard God's voice, Hineni in Hebrew means here am I. In other words, I'm the one you've been looking for. And then just as I'm feeling this incredible love and this amazing feeling, he disappeared. And I was looking everywhere for him, and I looked, and, and he reappeared again about 10 feet to the right. Again, looking at me as if I was the only person on planet Earth. I mean, who doesn't want someone's complete, undivided, full attention? That's what I had. And that's the attention that Jesus gives you when you call on him. Then again, he disappeared, and this time I'm beginning to panic again, and I was looking everywhere for him, and I couldn't find him. And uh, just to describe the third time and final time that he appeared to me, the first two times he was looking at me like I was the only person in the world. But the third time I was standing and I looked up on the wall and I saw him walking along the wall and I was facing the wall but he was walking this way to my right and he wasn't looking at me at all. In fact, it was as if I didn't exist. He was looking straight ahead of him resolutely walking along the wall of Jerusalem. And I didn't know how to pray as we do today. The only prayers I knew were pre-written prayers in Hebrew. But I just thought in my heart, I just thought, how I wish he would look at me just one more time. And as God is my witness, the second I thought how I wish he would look at me just one more time, just like this sister on the front row, the way I'm looking at her, he turned and looked me straight in the eye as if to say, the second you thought that, that was a prayer to me, and now I'm answering that prayer. And then he disappeared and he was gone. And there I was left standing there with my rugby playing wrestling buddy, drinking buddy. <laughs> no ways was I going to tell him what just happened. <laughs> he would have said I should go and see a psychiatrist or something. But I knew that what had happened to me was the most real thing that had ever happened in my life. All I can say is from that time onwards, my life was a blur. Went back to the kibbutz. I wanted to tell Frank, but he had already gone. He was the only other Christian I knew. Came back to United States, was going to my college to change my major, and there were some Jews for Jesus guys handing out tracts, and I, I ended up, long story short, going to see the Olympics in Los Angeles in 1984. Some of you will remember the Olympics back at that time. And I met another Jews for Jesus guy, and they invited me to a meeting on a Tuesday night. Walked into this meeting, and the guy who was speaking, um, was his name was Avi, and he was a small little guy, and I know that's not relevant to the fact, but I'm just saying he was very small, but he was powerful in the Lord, small but mighty. And, um, and I remembered seeing, just like we have in our Messianic service, Jews and Gentiles worshiping the God of Israel together through the Messiah Jesus, calling Jesus Yeshua. It made perfect sense to me. Now, you remember, there was Psalm 22. There's the vision I had of Jesus three times. And after the service, Avi came up to me and said, Hey, brother, do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? I said, yeah, <laughs> I guess I do. If I didn't believe by that time, I'd really have a thick head, you know. And uh, he said, have you ever prayed to receive God into your heart? Now, I had no idea what that meant, and I just thought, I remember thinking to myself, what a strange little man, <laughs> you know. Well, how is God going to fit into my heart? I mean, I'm a Jew. I know how huge God is, and I, I'm teeny compared to him, you know. So I had no clue what he meant. So he realized I needed some help, you know, some bit of training in theology or whatever. Took me into his office, showed me Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And I remember thinking, are you serious? Believe that God raised him from the dead? That is a hard pill to swallow. Now you must understand, I was 22 years old at that time. I'd seen Easter celebrated in South Africa and... And, but I just thought that's a time that you buy chocolate eggs for people and, and then like something to do with little chickens and bunnies and I, you know, I didn't quite know what it was all about. Just I had no clue. I was 22 years old. I had no clue that Jesus was supposed to have been risen from the dead. But I thought after everything that I've experienced and seen, at some point I've got to just take this by faith and I've got to pray this prayer and receive Jesus. And guess what? I prayed the prayer. I received Jesus and it took. <laughs> because when he comes, he comes to stay and he never leaves. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord.
And now it's easy to believe the resurrection because I've experienced it myself for 28 years. Amen, as many of you have. So let's just close in prayer just the, the last, uh, as we close out today, the last minute or two. And uh, this is a very important time. No one looking around. We just want to have a little private moment with the Lord. And, you know, maybe you know about Jesus. Maybe you even go to church, but you, you haven't. Because, look, I, I saw Jesus three times. I've already believed in him, but I still had to receive him. And the Bible says, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. And, and you know what? This is the safest, best place to receive Jesus. I wish I could have come to a place like this <laughs> long before I was 22. I really do. I wish I knew about a gateway before then. But if you don't have that assurance of your sins being forgiven today, God wants to give you that assurance today. That 100% knowing that you are forgiven and completely accepted. And if that's you and you want to just pray that prayer, I'm not going to embarrass you. If you want to pray that prayer today with no one looking around, just lift up your hand high in the air. You ought to be proud to lift your hand up. Lift your hand up high in the air and we're going to pray together. God bless you. Many hands going up. You ought to be proud to do that. Lift your hands up high. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. Probably the safest place in the world to pray. Many hands in the back there as well. Probably the safest place to pray to receive Jesus is right here in the house of God. What an honor and what a privilege. So, so let's just pray together. Let's pray aloud. Just right on our seats. Just pray the simple prayer after me. Just say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I receive you now as my Lord and my Messiah. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me, Jesus. I believe you died for me and you rose again. In Jesus' name, amen. I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord and everything changed. I didn't have any desire to go back to that old life. I wanted to walk with the Lord and learn more about Him. And some people helped me to learn the Bible and to learn how to pray and to learn about my new life in Christ. And that's what we want to do for you. I am so excited that you've given your life to the Lord. He's forgiven all of your sins and you're on your way to heaven. But we need to learn some things now about the Bible, about prayer, about some basics of the Christian life so that you can be victorious and live for the Lord like I know you want to. So we've designed a class called Fresh Start. And I want to encourage you to sign up for this class because we want to help you grow in your walk with the Lord now. I love you and I am so proud of you.